Good. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not quite with it. Um, Ms Trainer. Good morning, my lady. Just before we begin, there is one housekeeping matter I'd like to draw your attention to. The provisional timetable for today indicates that Sir David Starling's evidence should begin at 2pm. He will now commence giving his evidence at 11.45, just to make you aware. Thank you very much. Milady, may I call Eddie Lynch? I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. Thank you for attending today and for your assistance to the inquiry. At the outset, could I just remind you to try to speak slowly and speak into the microphone so that our stenographer can hear you for the transcript. You have provided Module 2C with one witness statement, which we have at INQ 0026797.8. You can now see that on the screen. And if we turn to page 42, we can see that you signed that statement on the 6th of September 2023. Are the contents of that statement true, to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes, they are. Mr Lynch, since June 2016, you have been the Commissioner for Older People in Northern Ireland. Prior to that, you were the Chief Executive of Age Sector Platform, a charity representing the interests of older people, is that right? That's correct, yeah. And the Commissioner for Older People is an independent statutory role established by the Commissioner for Older People Act, Northern Ireland, 2011. And the principal aim of your role is to safeguard the interests of older people in Northern Ireland. And as Commissioner, you have a number of mandatory statutory duties and powers. Could you provide us with a brief overview of your general powers and duties in illustrating what your role looks like in practice? Yes, of course. Um as Commissioner, my principal aim is to safeguard and promote the interests of older people in Northern Ireland. In, in part of this role, one of my roles is to advise government on older people's issues, um, to commission research into issues that I feel are of importance, um, make recommendations to government um, on issues that affect older people here, and have also legal powers in relation to investigations, and I can conduct formal and informal investigations as well. Um, and I suppose my, part of my role is to constantly review the services um, that older people receive um, and to influence policy, practice and, and legislation that affect the needs of older people in Northern Ireland. Thank you. And in the legislation, the primary definition of mm. older person is a person aged 60 or over. And in your statement, you have indicated that as of March 2021, Northern Ireland had an over 60s population of just under 440,000, or about 23% of our total population. Is that right? That's correct, yes. And clearly, that's a very large constituency and will capture a broad range of experiences and personal circumstances. In a few sentences, can you give us a brief overview of the characteristics of that older population in Northern Ireland? Well, it's a very di diverse population. Um, over 60 is a large category in terms of 60 to 100. Um, there's obviously ma many different issues for people of different ages. Um, we're living in an ageing population, um, which is a, a good news story, and people are living longer, healthier lives. Um, but there's clearly a lot of issues that affect um, older people in that age group as well, particularly when you get into the 70s and 80s plus group. A lot of issues around health and social care, um, a lot of major challenges in Northern Ireland in terms of meeting the needs of that ageing population. Mm -hmm. um, so whilst um, there are lots of positives with the ageing population and what it can provide to society, there are a lot of challenges that come with it that government needs to um, really address. And I think a lot of the issues that came up in the pandemic were reflective of some of the feelings that there have been in, in those issues. Well, let's turn then to look at your role during the pandemic. During that time, how did you go about gathering information as to the impact of the pandemic on older people? Well, it came in various ways. You know, as an independent body, we rely very much heavily on what people bring to us. Um, so we would have heard um, 
we would have had a lot of older people themselves coming to us with, with concerns, particularly as the pandemic approached. We would have a lot of families with concerns um, in relation to um, care homes and domiciliary care packages and things like that. But we had also had a lot of organisations that would have come to us as well um, and would expre ex express any concerns. So, for example, on the care home side of things, the independent health care providers would have been in contact um, with my office on numerous occasions in those early stages of the pandemic and they would have been reflecting issues that they were hearing on the ground in relation of the preparedness of that sector um, to, to, for COVID. Um, so really my office, we also would have reached out to any people with expertise. Um, you know, none of us are trained um, uh, professionals in epi 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 epidemiology or um, virology, so we would quite often have, have reached out to experts in those fields as well, as well as taking in the media, because obviously there was a lot of media coverage at the time about COVID, and it was a steep learning curve for us all, but our, our aim was to try to provide um, as strong a role as possible to ensure that older people were protected as, as best they could be. And in addition to that, you also participated in weekly Four Nations meetings of the UK network of older people's organisations. Very briefly, was that an effective forum for information sharing and to what extent did that inform your work? It was very effective. It came together um, organically, I suppose. It was an informal meeting um, with myself, the Welsh Commissioner for Older People, and many of the other older people's organisations across the UK. And it was a very useful um, forum for sharing what was happening. Um, this was new to everybody. The pandemic was something we hadn't experienced before. Um, the challenges it brought um, were new for a lot of us, um, and it was very useful to compare and contrast the different approaches being taken uh, by different uh, governments in different regions of the UK. And in terms of the impact then of COVID-19 <coughs> on older people, you've said in your statement that statistics and lived experience would suggest that your constituents are uniquely vulnerable to experiencing long-term physical or mental health conditions, loneliness, and to feel more significant physical impacts of being required to shield. Is that a fair summary? Yes, it is, yeah. And if we could have on screen, please, INQ 00237823. Now, Commissioner, this graphic is an extract from a survey that your office commissioned in September 2023 entitled Impacts of COVID-19 on Older People. And I'd just like to highlight a few of the key findings. So 32% of respondents experienced increased loneliness. 20% find it quite or very difficult getting shopping and other household necessities during COVID and lockdown. 25% find it harder than previously to access medical services such as GP surgeries. Now, the inquiry knows there were various initiatives progressed to try and mitigate some of those impacts. Very briefly, what is your view of the efficacy of those mitigations? Was this something about which you were receiving any feedback from older people and their families? Yes, um, I mean clearly the the impact of of lockdown was really significant in older people um, for many different reasons. It, it affected everyone in society, but for older people, it it affected them a lot more severely. Um, more older people were would it be living alone than other others in society. Um, they were also living with the fear of COVID. Um, they were very aware through the media that they were in the group uh, most vulnerable um, and at risk. Um, there were a lot of um, very good community initiatives uh, that were set up in the early stages. Um, there was a really good response around the, from the community and charity sectors about trying to assist older people you know, with their shopping. Um, making sure that they were calling in on, on and making sure they were okay. But clearly there were still you know, much higher levels of uh, fear and loneliness um, caused uh, by COVID. I think the other major issue was you know, a lot of older people still had not accessed the internet and that closed them off um, from the world um, a lot more than many other groups. And I think that made it um, even more uh, distressing for them, and I think that contributed to higher levels of anxiety, um, fear, and, and depression. Um, so that they were all factors. It was an extremely difficult time, and I think as well as we talk about you know the hospitals and the, and the care homes, it is really important to reflect on 
how lockdown affected people in the community as well. And you've just touched on the issue in Carrums. Perhaps we could take the document down now. Thank you. Um, you explain in your statement that at the outset of the pandemic, your office began to receive a large volume of complaints from older people, care providers and families on a range of concerns. And one of the first issues to emerge, it appears, was the discharge of patients from hospitals into care homes. And you explain in your statement that this was being raised with you on two fronts. Firstly, by care home providers, who reported feeling under pressure to accept new residents into their homes in the absence of adequate testing. And secondly, by the families of people residing in care homes. What were the concerns being identified to you about discharge into care homes and testing at that time, at the outset? Yeah, th this was a, a very serious concern, as you say, raised by both families and providers. And I think, you know, this was the early stages where there was um, a lot of there was a lot of awareness about the vulnerability of people living in care home settings, um, and how vulnerable they would be if COVID got into care home settings, given the, how, how quickly it could spread and how much at risk those people would be. Um, it did come to my attention several times about the hospitals being cleared out, as it was, to make space uh, for a possible surge of COVID patients. And part of that um, seemed to be discharging people into care homes um, where they could. I was very concerned, and so were the care home providers, that those people were put into those settings without testing. Um, it was very clear and obvious at that stage, um, whilst there were lo lots of things in this pandemic that were very new and you know, would have taken hindsight, I don't think it was, um, I think it was very clear cut that the policy of discharging people without testing into those settings was a potentially disastrous one. Um, I think it was quite reckless, a, a decision to take to allow that to happen. I think the, the, the um, reports that I was getting from the care home providers themselves showed that because they were very much aware of the risks that this policy w could have on their on their residents, and I think that is something that is a learning from this that this inquiry would look at to see, you know, if this was to happen again. Um, clearly, decisions like this need to be thought through, and the consequences of making those decisions need to be thought through. And I'm sure that that policy alone um, contributed to a lot of negative outcomes in homes. <clears throat> Now, we'll return in just a moment to talk about your engagement with government on these issues. But in terms of the issues being raised at the outset, was the issue of restrictions on visiting also raised with you? And if so, what were you hearing about the impact of that on older people? Yes, at, at the start, um, <clears throat> the issue of visiting, it, it was very clear that the best chance to protect life in care homes was to reduce the amount of people, the amount of footfall into care home settings. Um, and the authorities were pretty unanimous in, in saying that to, to try to protect the residents and try to reduce the number of infections, that they would have to suspend all visiting. Uh, I thought that was probably the only decision that could be taken at the time, um, given that we you know, had no vaccine, we had already saw across Europe, the impact um, that COVID could have when it got into a care home setting. So that, that decision was really born out of a desire to protect life. I think when you look back and then the learning as the, as the pandemic um, went into a number of months, it was clear that there was negative impacts with that as well, that the impact of no social contact between residents and their families uh, had a very detrimental um, effect on both, and I think one of the, you know, that that lasted for a, a long period of time. Um, we were aware of many cases that came to us that were really distressing cases, um, where families were desperate to get in to see their loved ones, um, that they could see uh, their loved ones deteriorating. Um, and they couldn't do anything about it or they couldn't be there to comfort them. And that was deeply distressing. And I think, I would think that one of the things that I would like to see come out of this inquiry would be how that sort of situation could be managed better in future. Because whilst we had to have the ring of steel around homes and try to keep out infections, and I think that was initially the right decision, I do think we, you know, we saw the devastating impact 
on the residents, many of whom lived their last months of their lives um, without that, that family and social contact. Have you had any thoughts, well, by sounds of it, you think a lot about this subject, Mr Lynch. Have you had any thoughts about how you can, so on the one hand, you're protecting physical life, as it were, as opposed to death, uh, but on the other hand, you've got the mental issues of um, both, as you say, on the residents and the family. I mean, do you draw a distinction between when a resident has got COVID? I mean, have you thought about how you might change the rules for the future, what guidance might be given in the future? I think if I think this comes down to prep, preparedness for the pandemic as well, and it was new. We weren't experienced in any way of dealing with this. Um, there was steps that were taken by government, for example, making some money available to care homes. So we talked about the, the ability for care homes to create visiting pods and spaces and safer spaces. I think in the future that would be something that you'd want to see expanded. I think now that we've been through this experience, I think looking back on that, you need to be thinking, well, if this was to happen again, here's several ways that we could bring in some level of contact with families. You know, I think the situation was taken for the right reasons in terms of suspending visiting, but there's no doubt the, the consequence of that was devastating for many people. So I think, you know, having been through it, I think there are ways that, um, that contact could be increased. Um, there are, you know, with the right infection control measures in place, there were things that came in um, later on in the pandemic that worked quite well. Um, but I think one of the things that I would say is, uh, whilst you know there were many people, my office was getting a very mixed response from families in relation to this. You know, whilst many people. Um, wanted changes and, and lifting of visiting restrictions. There was an equally large number of people who wanted them kept in place and, and wanted the, the ring of steel, if you like, kept for longer. But I, I think it's very clear now as we look at the evidence that um, it, it's, not, it's not hard to, to visualise the impact that had on so many residents, um, many of whom wouldn't have had capacity to know what was going on. And I think that was what was so distressing for both them and their families. So I, I do think, I don't have all the, the, the answers, but there are certain things that I think could be done in those settings that, that would allow care home providers and government to work more quickly in, in a future situation. The other thing that I would say is I think that the care home providers themselves should have been engaged with at a higher level than they were. I think there was guidance, um, there was guidance produced. Um, we, my, myself and my team, we had sight of that only a day before it was published. I know the providers would have liked um, a lot more opportunity to influence that guidance. So when it was introduced, it was more effective. So I think there are, there are things that could, could work, could happen now, parts of work that actually could um, foresee a future pandemic and could think outside the box about the different ways and different methods that we could keep some sort of human human response. Thank you. Commissioner, just picking up on what you've just been talking about, it's clear from your statement that the families of older people are a particularly important part of your network. They are very often, you say, the first to raise an issue and they are perhaps your eyes and ears. Recognising the importance of families as a source of intelligence for you, how did restrictions on visiting impact your ability to perform your function as commissioner during the pandemic? <clears throat> well, uh, you know, as you say, the families are the eyes and ears on the ground, and um, you know, in our social care system, particularly within care home settings, we have you know the the, the RQIA who do the inspections and mm -hmm. ensure standards are being met. But I actually think you know. There's nothing that beats the families on the ground being in there on a regular basis, you know, to, to ensure um, everything is well. I think it was one of the unfortunate consequences of the restrictions that that oversight of care within homes was certainly reduced, and that was an added um, fear for family members in that situation. Again, you know, looking back. Uh, would it, would it have been better to still have a degree of inspections going in 
Um, that may have been the case. Again, it, it's weighing up the risk. Um, but I think there w it did raise major concerns that there wasn't that scrutiny and oversight at the time. My, my office was conscious of that. Um, what we did a lot was with, we were working with the care home providers as organisation. We wanted to be as supportive as possible. We wanted the care homes to get as much support as, as, as they could get. Because I think one of the things we were very conscious about it at that time was the, the response to the pandemic was adding costs to care homes. You know, just by the extra, um, you know, the, the extra work they had to do, the infection control, um, they were under major pressure in terms of staffing as well. You know, a lot of care workers got COVID themselves. So it, the conditions that they were working in were, were very extremely difficult. And I think, again, that's where, you know, I think they would have, it would be better for them to get a, a higher level of support in any future to ensure that they um, could do their jobs as best as possible and keep people safe. Thank you. And I'll just move on then to look at your engagement with government throughout the pandemic. In your statement, you describe various difficulties in terms of your ability to engage meaningfully with government throughout the pandemic. And if I may summarise your evidence like this, you refer to the absence of a designated single point of contact within the Department of Health, which you say curtailed your ability to get in touch with the right people. You describe occasions where you felt you had no choice but to have recourse to the media in order to present your concerns. You explain how, at times, and I think you've just touched on this, guidance was circulated to your office at such late notice as to really preclude meaningful consideration and response. And you also suggest that there was no proper forum for you to present your concerns in a constructive way. Now, in your statement, you refer to having established trusted lines of communication with, amongst others, the Chief Social Work Officer and the Director of Mental Health, Disability and Older People within the Department of Health. And you said that those predated the pandemic and you relied on those during the pandemic, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Picking up on the point about the absence of a single point of contact, is it not the case that the Chief Social Worker and the Director of Mental Health, Disability and Older People were the appropriate points of contact for you during the pandemic? There was a lot of issues coming to my office at the time, and the health department is a, is a big department, and a lot of the issues, I remember, we weren't sure ourselves who, who were the right people to speak, speak to in the health service. So whilst it's true to say that we had um, fairly regular meetings with some key officials, the, the speed and frantic nature of the pandemic meant issues were coming up on a daily basis, on an hourly basis at times, and there was times when we felt that we needed an urgent answer to things, and there were certainly times where we felt frustrated that we couldn't get speaking to the right person, or it took some time to get responses to things. So there was a sense, I think that whilst we did have you know, several meetings and contacts, because of the nature of what we were dealing with, we felt sometimes frustrated that we couldn't get the answers that we wanted. And, and I certainly felt at times um, it took a while before we could get answers to certain questions. Also, some of the concerns that I was raising, of course, I didn't get the answers that I, I wanted, or I wasn't assured that maybe enough work was going on, on in certain areas. So that sort of fed into that sort of sense of could the communication between myself and my team and the department been streamlined and, and improved? Well, perhaps let's look in a, at an example which might demonstrate your point. Um, if we could have up on screen, please, INQ 00267978. Now, this is your statement. At paragraph 68, you are referring to a meeting that you were invited to by the Chief Medical Officer on the 16th of March 2020. And the purpose of that meeting was to discuss guidance, which was forthcoming for care homes. And I, I'll just read what you've said about that. You say, the officials were unable to address many of the issues the commissioner raised. I'll pause here. Your chief executive attended this meeting in your stead. It wasn't you. Is that right? That's correct. I was meeting the minister at the time. And it soon became clear that some of these issues had simply not been considered before, nor had sufficient thought been given to the practical outworking of the guidance. Importantly, the lack of consultation with the sector was raised. I and indeed my team regarded the draft guidance as unrealistic and impractical. In our view, it required consultation. 
More significantly, Copney was informed that there was simply not enough time to address the points being made, as the guidance had to be issued the next day, which was St Patrick's Day. My chief executive reported orally to me after that meeting that despite her drawing attention to the high numbers of elderly in Italy who were contracting and dying of COVID-19, there was an hour of unreality. The view expressed by the Public Health Agency seemed to be, that won't happen here. They have a completely different system over there. Pausing here, may I ask you this? Might that suggest that due to a lack of preparedness on those issues, there was perhaps a failure to appreciate what actions may be required in the event of a pandemic? Absolutely. Uh, this guidance had been developed really uh, quickly, um, literally within days. But as you say, this was the middle of March at this stage. Um, at this stage, we had known for several weeks that the pandemic was going, was coming. And um, we certainly had a lot of concerns with regard to the care home sector, given that we had um, the advantage of seeing what had happened in other countries as it, as it came towards Northern Ireland. Um, we were very frustrated that we didn't have more time to engage with the department on that guidance. Um, rather than issuing it the next day, I think the focus should have been on getting that guidance as good, make it as good as possible, rather than just getting it out. We had met with the, my chief executive had met with the independent healthcare providers on it. Uh, they had raised significant concerns about it. They felt that the guidance was actually going to be very confusing for care home operators, but also in many ways totally unrealistic. There was also a fear that if they couldn't meet the guidance, what would happen to, to them as well. So this is a good example of something that I felt should have been done uh, much earlier. It should have been in place in, in, in proper planning for a pandemic situation. We should have had guidance like this sitting there ready to go. But even in the absence of that, I think there would have been sufficient time through January and February to have worked on that guidance, worked with the key, the key, the key stakeholders, which in this case would, would have been the care home providers, and actually developed something that was very much more workable on the ground, and then and therefore more effective um, in, in managing care in this challenging situation. And you've just reiterated there your point that you thought the guidance was unrealistic and impractical. Very briefly, why did you think that? It was, it was putting a lot of extra responsibilities on, on the care homes without proper consultation with them. So we weren't experts in running care homes, but the providers were. So there was a lot of things in the guidance that they just felt was impractical. Um, that was hard to deliver, certainly hard to deliver, you know, overnight practically. Um, clearly, there was there were big challenges that they were facing at this time, um, that they were were very keen to get into discussion on. One of the big big issues that they were raising was again the ongoing lack of uh, PPE equipment that they were facing. Uh, they had raised concerns at this time around testing as well. So there was a lot of things being put onto them but they actually felt there were some really big issues that weren't being addressed. And there really was a willingness on the care home side to really engage on these issues. They wanted to, to work with government um, to ensure that they could do their job as best they could. Uh, this was a very worrying time, not least, you know, they had concerns around their own staff, their own workforce, you know, the, the implications of staff leaving or staff getting sick with COVID and their ability to, to manage this. So I think the approach should have been a lot more um, iterative, really, and, and really they should have, it, there should have been a more of a partnership approach to this. Um, and I think a, a, a more of a partnership approach to getting care right would have actually been more, much more effective on the ground and would introduce um, new practices a lot more quickly than they actually ended up being. And just picking up on, on that point about the need for consultation and engagement, do you suggest it would have been appropriate for the department to have delayed the issue of that guidance to facilitate further consultation and engagement? Or do you not consider that that? Yes, necessary? I do. I, I don't think the guidance when it was introduced was effective. I think it, it, needed, it needed a lot of work after that 
to actually put into place in practice good practices. So whilst I would have preferred if that engagement process had happened much sooner, you know, maybe through February, um, I think it would have been, a lot, we would have ended up with a lot more strong guidance if, if there had been allowed uh, an, a, you know, an extra week, for, for instance, to go through uh, what care homes were required to do and how, it, more importantly, how it was going to be done, because guidance is fine on paper, but if it can't be put into practice, then it's, it's not much use. Okay. Now, one of the issues this module is examining is the impact of the absence of power sharing immediately prior to the pandemic in terms of the response to the pandemic thereafter. And in your statement, you suggest that weaknesses in the social care system were evident from a number of previous reports prepared both by your office and indeed the Bengoa report. And you say this, you say, therefore, when the transmission rate of COVID-19 started to rise markedly and a government response was required, those weaknesses in the structure for delivering adult social care and their implications should have been appreciated and factored into planning to avoid potentially disastrous outcomes for older people. Firstly, can it be taken from your evidence there that those pre-existing weaknesses hadn't been addressed in the interim and were in fact still very much present at the outset of the pandemic in 2020? Yes, absolutely. They were, hor they were horribly exposed. And I think, as you said, that my office had been calling for several years um, about major changes that were needed to fix the system. And I think the absence of government over that time um, and didn't allow progress to be made um, against the recommendations that came out of several reports um, advising that change was needed. And without diverting into the substance of previous reports and their recommendations, <coughs> to what extent do you consider that those weaknesses had been appreciated and factored into planning and decision making by the department during the pandemic? <coughs> I'm not sure. I mean, I think the pandemic pandemic was such a shock. I think it, there was a very much a reactive um, response from the department to to planning and protecting people. I think one of the, the most striking features of the early months of the pandemic was the difference in how the NHS was viewed and how the social care sector was viewed. I mean, Northern Ireland is often put up as different from the rest of the UK, that it has an integrated health and social care system. But I think what the pandemic showed was just the dividing line between the two and, and the approach taken by the department. Um, the, there was clearly a focus on protecting the NHS. Um, the concern was clearly about hospital capacity. Um, but as a result of that, we saw a lot of the, the care home and social care sector really struggle. And I had many care home providers, both care home providers and, and domiciliary care providers, come into my office a lot in those early weeks, saying that, they, in their words, they felt high and dry that they were being left to fend for themselves, um, not least the issues around PPE, where they felt they weren't getting the support, despite reassurances that the trust, the health trust should have been providing that. On the ground, that clearly wasn't happening, and it did take several weeks um, to sort that issue out. And you've touched there on the issue of the integrated health and social <coughs> care system that we have here in Northern Ireland, which is distinct. Can you give us your views as to whether there may have been any untapped advantages inherent in that system, um, which could have been exploited during the pandemic? And if you do think that that's the case, your views on the extent to which those were sufficiently capitalised upon by decision makers? I think there was a lot of things that could have been done better. I think the fact that, for a start, Northern Ireland is not a very big place. Um, the fact we had an integrated health and social care sector, that there was those relationships in place that people knew. Um, there was definitely clear relationships and clear contact. I don't think those contacts were maximised in the way they, they could have been. I think there was a lot of expertise out there, not just in the, in the care home sector, uh, but across different fields, um, you know, academics, you know, experts in, in the transmission of, of, of diseases like this. Um, and I don't think a lot of that was tapped into in, in the response from government. Um, there was a lot of guidance developed, but 
as we've talked about already, a lot, a lot of that times that guidance when it hit the ground didn't actually deliver effective results and it needed to be revised several times. And I think that was something that was a theme of the early stages that there could have been a lot more bringing together of expertise uh, and producing more effective responses. Thank you, Commissioner. My lady, I have no further questions. You have already granted permission for a number. Thank you very much, Ms Campbell. Thank you, my lady. Uh, and thank you, Mr Lynch. My name is Brenda Campbell and I represent the Northern Irish COVID <coughs> bereaved. Um, it has been touched upon briefly in your evidence already. Uh, and you stated, I think it's paragraph 31 of your statement, if we want to bring it up, that there are a series of historic COPNY reports, in fact, that predate your tenure as commissioner, that have highlighted serious and long-standing concerns about the provision of care to older people in our society and also identify recommendations for reform. And I want to look at one of them. It's, I, I don't require it to be put up on screen, <coughs> but it's a 2015 document that I'm sure you're familiar with about prepared to care and modernising adult social care. You exhibit it in your statement. And that review identifies the following, that legislation and policy guidance surrounding adult social care is in the North outdated, confusing and fragmented, and that it needs to be fully updated to reflect and meet the needs of our modern society. Now, you're, you're nodding your head. That was the situation in 2015. Is it still the situation today? There have been, I mean, I think there's a, there, the lack of progress has been frustrating for me in terms of adult social care. There are things that are happening now in terms of reform of adult social care, but as you said, this is nine years on from that report. Um, there are there have been some steps taken, for, for instance, there's an adult protection bill that is close to fin being finalised that's going, that hopefully will be going through the Assembly and that's around adult safeguarding legislation. Hopefully that will come in, into law within the, in the foreseeable future. Um, but I have been, through my eight years as Commissioner, frustrated with how slow the process has been to address the very clear issues in, in an adult social care, and it has been exposed several times, as you know, as you mentioned, there's been a number of reports. Um, my investigation into Dunmurry Manor and my Home Truths report outlined over 50 recommendations for change as well, some of which are happening. But again, the pace of change is slow, and in an ageing population, one of the things that I have been saying consistently is these issues are issues now, but with an ageing population, these issues are only going to become more serious if more action is not taken and more focus is not taken on these areas. And we can't afford, I think the, what the pandemic showed, we can't afford to sit on these issues any longer. We need actions and real change to be brought into play to best protect some of the most vulnerable in society. I suppose one of the um, consequences that your 2015 report identified, and I suspect you've identified on a number of occasions since, is that the effect of legislation that's out of date and that doesn't meet the needs of our ageing population is to disadvantage older people in terms of accessing um, what social care ser services are available to them and also their loved ones in terms of understanding um, their route through that system. Is that, is that something that you recognise as a problem? Yes, it, it is a problem, and I think one of the other things in Northern Ireland specifically is we don't have age discrimination legislation and goods, facilities and services, so we still remain the only part of the UK or Ireland that doesn't have that protection in. It leaves people vulnerable and not, not as protected as they could be. And there are other areas, for instance, if you, in the last couple of months I've produced, published a report in relation to uh, older people's rights in care homes, in relation to their, their tenure of contract, the contract and, and how they have very little rights in terms of, um, uh, uh, and we have seen as a result of that issues around people being evicted from care homes, uh, being moved out, being sent to hospital and then being refused admission back to their own home. So these are all clearly deeply worrying aspects of the system that we have, and all of these issues need to be focused on going forward. Her Ladyship heard evidence yesterday from Marion Reynolds, who explained that, I don't know if you heard it yourself, Commissioner, but 
Um, she had a long uh, history of employment in the health and social care sector as a, as a senior social worker. Um, but notwithstanding her experience, she found that the process of trying to access care for her aunt was really, I think, disempowering and, and difficult. Would that surprise you? Unfortunately not. Um, a lot of the cases that come to my office are with people dealing with the health system and, and the barriers that they face in raising legitimate concerns about care and treatment um, is very worrying. Uh, again, I found that a lot in my Dunmore Manor investigation. It was, it was very obvious that people, who, family members who were actually very strong advocates for their loved ones, found it very difficult to get anywhere with the system, to, to hear their genuine concerns to be heard. And not only that, but the evidence I got in that investigation also showed that people working in the system felt the same way as well. People working in the system would have raised concerns at times, and those concerns went unheeded, and that's deeply worrying. So, you know, the likes of Marion giving evidence yesterday, unfortunately, um, I have come across many older people in, in this role, in my previous role, who worked in the health system and actually were very frustrated and actually felt quite often they, they got into campaigning organisations to try to change that and try to change that culture. Um, Ms Trainer, and I'm grateful to her, has um, focused on paragraph 68 of your statement where we looked at that early guidance in March 2020. Um, but I wonder if we could just move along in terms of the timeline to the period of autumn 2020, when, again, in your statement, you draw attention to a letter that you had drafted to the Minister of Health, Mr Swan, on the 8th of October, in which you highlight concerns in respect of um, the on-the-ground on feasibility of the care partner guidance. Okay, and we've heard something about that, and I know her leadership is is familiar with it. I, again, I won't ask for it to be put on screen, but you say to the Commissioner, or sorry, to the, the Minister on the 8th of October, that your office has spent the past four weeks dealing with calls from families in distress and then angry when their care uh, providers can't deliver the access to their loved ones that they believe that they should be entitled to. And in fact, under the guidance, I think we're entitled to. And you also are dealing with calls from home providers stating that they can't safely deliver um, the visiting arrangements that the guidance outlined. A and you detail the distress um, on all sides when that guidance wasn't able to be put into practice. And we heard again something of that yesterday through the evidence of Marion Reynolds. And I think you'll know that it's also an area of significant concern to many of our client group, including uh, Martina Ferguson, who I think has been in contact with you about mm -hmm. her inability to visit her mother over a nine-month period. Is it correct to say that as a consequence of that Department of Health issued guidance in September 2020, members of the public <coughs> ought to have a legitimate expectation to get in, to see their loved ones, to care for them again, after very, a, a large period in which they were denied that opportunity? Yes, and I, I, I remember that period very well because it had become increasingly obvious to me that the, the lack of visiting was having a negative impact on, on the residents and the families. And I remember the car, car partner uh, scheme being developed, and it was a very welcome scheme. There was clearly lots of communication problems around that scheme. Um, we did get several uh, people coming to the office who were saying that the, the care home that their loved one was in I was saying that they hadn't heard of the scheme, that they weren't aware of it, that they weren't introducing it. So there was a mixed p picture out there. The care partner scheme was a step forward in at least getting some uh, family contact again. Um, but I remember still that there was ongoing issues. Um, and Martina was one of the people who came to our office and, you know, was desperate to visit her, her mother, Ursula, in, in the home. And there was clearly still a lot of uncertainty out there in the care home sector about what, what they could do. There was also a lot of fear because a lot of care home providers were coming back around uh, liability issues, insurance issues. And there was a lot of uncertainty from their behalf. But there was clearly... Um, some homes doing it better than others, and I think some homes certainly communicating that service was available better than others. 
um, because when it worked, it worked well. And, and did those problems persist significantly after your letter of the 8th of October and further into the winter? It was a gradual process. Um, I remember that whole situation with visiting for months on end was, you know, it was, grad and it was gradually getting better, but it, it did take um, several months before it seemed to go through the system. Um, and there was a lack of consistency. And I think, I don't know whether some of that was down to care homes having the uh, the staffing arrangements, the resources in place to put it in place. I think there was certainly part of that where homes were struggling in terms of staff numbers. And again, that's something that we need to reflect on because we need to have a, a stronger social care workforce going forward in the future in terms of, you know, providing them with better pay and conditions and, and you know, reflecting on the brilliant role that social care workers played throughout the pandemic. So, but that whole issue of visiting was a very complicated one. I remember there was an ongoing group with members of the families, um, you know, with the department, with the public health agency, uh, and was clearly by that stage an area that we were very aware, aware of and the families were very conscious of as well. And just finally picking up on the question from her ladyship earlier, that is surely an area that we can work on to do better in future. Absolutely. I think that issue of human contact and visiting um, would have to be something that a future pandemic needs to get better. Thank you, Milady. Thank you, Ms Campbell. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Lynch. Thank you for all you did and all you tried to do. And don't give up. Okay. Keep banging the drum. Thanks very much, Milady. Thank you. Thank you. Don't get comfy, you're going to have to stand again, I'm afraid. <laughs> Ms. Dunham. To affirm. Thank you, my lady. Uh, may I please call Mr. Jerry Murphy? If you could stand up, please. I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you for attending today, Mr. Murphy, and for your assistance to the inquiry. Uh, before I begin with my questions, there are just a few uh, matters I want to bring to your attention. Whilst giving your evidence, please keep your voice up and speak into the microphone so that the stenographer can hear you for the transcript. If any question that I ask is unclear, please do say so and I will rephrase it. Um, and if you'd like a break at any time, please just say so. Um, you've provided this module, Mr. Murphy, of the inquiry with a witness statement. Um, you should see that in front of you on the screen. Um, if we scroll down to the uh, last page, uh, page 17, we can see there it's dated the 17th of August 2023. Can you confirm, Mr Murphy, that the statement is true to the best of your knowledge and belief? I can. Thank you. Mr Murphy, you are the Assistant General Secretary of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. Is that correct? That is indeed correct. And you've held this position since 13th of March 2023? Yes. And previously you held the roles of chairperson of the Northern Ireland Committee of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions as well as uh, president of the same organisation? Correct. Yeah. Um, for the purposes of your evidence, uh, Mr Murphy, I'll refer to the Irish Congress of Trade Unions as ICTU uh, and for my lady as well to note. Uh, it's correct that the Northern Ireland Committee of ICTU is a separate organisation to the Trades Union Congress, uh, but in fact the organisations work together and have shared objectives. Is that correct? That is indeed correct. And putting it simply, um, the Northern Ireland Committee of, uh, of ICTU's role is, is simply to, to represent and advance the interests of workers. Is that a fair sort of brief summary? Indeed it is. <laughs> 
Um, in, in terms of the, the membership, uh, Mr Murphy, uh, ICTU is in fact the largest civil society organisation on the island of Ireland. It has 44 affiliated unions, north and south of the border, and it covers a wide cross-section of professions and sectors. Yes. Um, the Northern Ireland Committee of ICTU is the representative body for 34 trade unions, and it has um, over 200,000 members across Northern Ireland. Correct again, yes. Mr Murphy, I want to now move to consider the Strategic um, Engagement Forum. It was established in April 2020, and it brought together employers, trade unions and statutory bodies, including the Health and Safety Executive for Northern Ireland and the Public Health Agency. Please could you explain why it was created and what its purpose was? Before I do that... Today is um, May Day, International Workers' Day, and I would like to acknowledge the fact that 400 people of working age, that is those aged between 18 and 65, died over the course of this pandemic. Um, I do sincerely hope that the evidence that I give here today, and indeed the work of this inquiry as a whole, will aid the creation of a set of circumstances where such a situation will never arise again. In respect then to the, um, the engagement forum, the engagement forum was something which we at the Irish Congress of Trade Unions had long called for, indeed far in advance of the outbreak of any pandemic. Um, we believe and continue to believe that there is a need for sy systematic and long-term uh, triumvirate engagement, if you like, between uh, the government, employers and trade unions, something which we believe is in the best interests of workers and their families, but also um, society as a whole, the economy in general, and good governance. Um, the, the engagement forum was established in March of uh, 2020, um, I was a participant. There were five, um, six actually trade union representatives on the body as a whole. Um, it, it was tasked with providing advice and counsel to the government of Northern Ireland around um, how their response to the pandemic could be managed across the economy and the, the workforce, the labour market. It initially did some really good work. Um, it confirmed from a trade union point of view, which was most gratifying, that it was possible to work collaboratively with the government and the employers. Um, we did that. We produced some very valuable um, work. We were the people who identified the list of key workers. We were the people who provided the list of essential uh, sectors. Um, we developed particular guidances around health, um, advice, uh, um, viral mitigations to be distributed to workforce uh, to the workforce, and you know how that might be done, and how it would be best shared, and who needed to be informed. All of that was done by the engagement forum, and done. Um, in a remarkably short period of time, considering how long it sometimes takes to get a decision made in this place. Um, that was done in a matter of weeks, um, uh, just, two, two weeks. I'm just going to stop you there, Mr mm. Murphy. That's, it's all extremely helpful. Um, was there any engagement um, of this kind in the sense of a forum that was in place between the executive and trade unions before the pandemic? No, indeed there wasn't, um, and um, this forum, the, the one which we are now talking about, didn't survive terribly long either. Uh, effectively, by the middle of 2020, um, this forum had um, ceased to function effectively at all and was indeed only meeting intermittently and 
was um, by 2021 being referred, or the Department of the Economy had referred it for review to a, an academic in the University of Ulster, effectively ending the functioning of that um, that body, the engagement forum. It, was particularly disappointing from a trade union point of view because it had done some very good work, it had confirmed to us, and it had confirmed, we believe, to the government and to the employers that collaborative working across the th these three key sectors was possible. Um, but it was ad, ad hoc in nature, not what we really wanted um, and not what we want going forward because we would still maintain that, that this is an effective way to get things done in terms of the labour market. Um, thank you. Mr Murphy, you helpfully set out um, a short while ago the, the sort of work that the forum w was engaged in and what it managed to achieve. Um, and you, you noted two particular pieces of work, uh, preparing a list of key workers and essential and non-essential businesses. Uh, and it also established an emergency code of practice to assist businesses and their workforces in complying with COVID-19 related guidance and regulations, uh, and that, that work was achieved. Um, I, I want to now look um, at INQ number 00027938 You'll see that up on your screen. It's um, a note of a meeting that took place on the 10th of June, um, so some time after the forum had been established in April 2020. And, and this was a meeting that was requested by the Northern Ireland Committee of Vic2. And the Deputy First Minister, Michelle O'Neill, was present including yourself as a representative of the uh, National Teachers Organisation. That's correct? That's correct, yes. Um, if, if we look on this first page, um, at paragraph two, it sets out there um, that Owen Reedy outlined three issues. Um, as you said, the, the forum was seen as, as a very helpful way in which to continue the engagement between the trade unions and the executive. And there was a request for more formal quarterly engagement um, and acknowledgement about what the forum was set up to do. Um, and if we look further on at paragraph three, I think that's across the page, um, the Deputy First Minister herself paid tribute to workers, uh, particularly those on the front line, and we'll look uh, further into that uh, later on. And she indicated her support for more regular, formal engagement with trade unions and acknowledged the work that had been undertaken. And she was supportive of the idea of it continuing beyond the pandemic. If we look also at paragraph eight, please. So that's the last one. Uh, it looks there as if, it's, as if it's in draft form. But it says, the meeting concluded with the Deputy First Minister confirming that she would speak to the Health Minister, Robin Swan, about the issues raised um, that will have significant impact in the event of a second wave and reiterated her commitment to effective engagement going forward. You noted earlier when discussing um, the work of the forum that uh, it, what we know ended up happening was that it didn't continue. Having now looked at what was discussed and acknowledged by the Deputy First Minister herself, it seemed to be positively received in the sense of what it created in, in terms of engagement between trade unions and the executive. In your statement, you, you note that, of course, after the initial work that was undertaken, the forum was unfortunately largely ignored by the executive, which you've alluded to. Why do you think this was? Um, the, the note of the meeting there is from June. We had made numerous requests uh, by that point to meet with the office of the First and Deputy First Minister. The First Minister and um, indeed the two junior ministers in that office met with us on that date. And as you can see, my, well, I'm not going to rehash what's in the thing. Your question is why... why it, it was why you thought um, that the engagement didn't continue, given the, the, the positive reception that at least Deputy um, Minister Michelle O'Neill had acknowledged and articulated in the passages that I read out from this meeting in June. Uh, uh, 
I'm not really sure why it didn't continue, and, and, and I would suggest respectfully that you know that possibly a question that that needs to be addressed to um, um, Ms. Foster or Ms. O'Neill, um, you know, in in, in, the, in their role. We felt certainly that, that the engagement forum, as the Deputy First Minister reflected or is reflected in the note, that it was very useful, um, notwithstanding the limitations which I pointed out. But um, you know, I, I really can't speak for them, um, and I don't really have a view as to why they didn't wish um, to see it continue. Mr Murphy, since um, the forum in 2021, as you have explained, um, drew to a close in the way it had been established, has there been anything else since of its kind? There was, the, there was a, quite a long hiatus, um, really from the middle of 2020 until just recently, um, and in the last number of weeks, we have, um, along with um, the employers and the Labour Relations Agency and the Department for the Economy, gone back to a body similar in nature to the engagement forum. Indeed, it's probably going. It, it, we're in the very initial stages uh, of establishing this body. Um, we haven't even got so far as to formally confirming a name, but it's likely to be to include the engagement forum uh, moniker, I suppose. Uh, so we've had that hiatus really from 2020 until now. Um, there is a recognition on the part of the Department for the Economy <coughs> of what uh, the Deputy First Minister reflected in that note of the June meeting you know, reflected the positive benefits of that social dialogue model. Um, so it's taken a while, but we appear to have the beginnings of such a model developing again. Thank you, Mr Murphy. I want to move on now to, to briefly consider briefings that were made by the Northern Ireland Committee of ICTU to the, the government in Northern Ireland. Um, was uh, the committee involved or made aware in any way in advance um, of the strategy that the government in Northern Ireland was going to adopt in response to the pandemic? So in the period sort of January to March or before the forum was established in April 2020? Um, the short answer to your question is no, um, we were not. Um, we were not involved in any planning, as I, as I you know, um, in my evidence, module one, you know, said. So we weren't involved um, in, in the, any planning, and we weren't involved in the initial stages of the response, the very initial stages of the response, apart from us communicating to them concerns that we had about um, you know, the risks being faced by the workforce uh, and indeed their families and society more generally. But they did not formally reach out to us, no. The Northern Ireland Committee of ICTU, in terms of its structure, has policy subcommittees, and they briefed um, the committees of the Northern Ireland Assembly in a number of areas. Uh, so the health unions briefed members of the Legislative Assembly on the Health Scrutiny Committee on general NPI matters, that's non-pharmaceutical interventions, in May and June of 2020, and were also asked to give detailed evidence um, on the situation developing inside care homes. There were also briefings in relation to education and the situation arising inside schools in August and September of 2020, and there was also um, the Retired Workers' Committee, which was in dialogue with the Northern Ireland Older People's Commissioner, who we just heard evidence from. Mr Murphy, to what extent do you think that these briefings um, impacted decision-making? Um, well, the, the committees to which you refer, or 
to which you were referring to perform extremely valuable work. And what they do is they reflect to they reflect the views of the membership of the trade unions. Um, and what they were doing to those storm and scrutiny committees um, was reflecting those views. Um, the, the degree to which they impacted um, decision making, I, I think it would be fair to say, was um, fairly limited in so far as, you know, there was no. The, the the committee were, the the committee was um, looking at what was coming forward, but it, um, the situation was so fluid and, and moving so quickly that the information that the committee was gathering was in many cases already um, out of date. Probably, you know, as near as you could describe it, but. It was nonetheless valuable because what it was, it was reflecting the experience of workers and their families to to the legislative assembly, and therefore in, informing to some degree um, the decision making. But as I was saying, or as I'm suggesting here, it, it, it was in many cases after decisions had been taken or, you know, um, as decisions were playing out actually in, in real time. So limited is, I think, what I'm suggesting. And, and can you provide uh, p perhaps in a particular example of an area where briefings were made and albeit, as you've said, decisions may have already been taken or the briefings that were being given were perhaps a step behind, they were still positively received or able to make? Well, I think the interactions with the, between the health, uh, the ECTU Health Committee and the, the Scrutiny Committee in Health are particularly helpful. They were helpful for both because what what, what was lacking, or one of the things I feel that was lacking across government in terms of decision making was the voice of the worker directly feeding in. So it wasn't feeding in, for example, at the level of the first deputy first minister. It was feeding in to a degree um, across some of the departments because some of the departments, particularly those departments with um, established bargaining processes, um, you know, and established established lines of communication, um, you know, allowed for there was a mechanism to feed in at that point, but um, in other areas, the health and safety executive for Northern Ireland being an example, um, you know, it has a board. Um, for which there is provision and its underpinnings for three worker representatives. But for over a decade, there wasn't any worker representatives on that board. Um, so vital workplace and workforce intelligence wasn't available to them. So there were, there were some opportunities to feed in, and, um, but, but there wasn't a systematic or government-wide or joined-up approach to that. Thank you. Mr Murphy, I want to move on now to consider the workforce during the pandemic in a little more detail. There are 30,000 workers in Northern Ireland who are employed through employment agencies and a large proportion of them during the pandemic were migrant workers who worked in ag agriculture and food processing. So they were on the front line. Is that right? That, that's absolutely correct, yes. Um, and as you alluded to earlier, it's also right that the highest proportion of deaths amongst people of working age in Northern Ireland were among workers from processing plants and machine operatives, as I've said. Yes, 13.4% of that 400 who lost their lives were in that sector. Mr Murphy, I just want to take a look now um, at a letter that was sent by uh, Kevin Doherty, who was um, from the Migrant Workers Support Unit of ICTU. 
and it was sent to the minister, as you can see there on the screen, for communities, Carol Nichulin, regarding... Um, You'll, you'll perhaps note from this letter if, if you've seen it before, it was regarding the decision to halt the issuing of national insurance numbers, uh, the impact on new workers, and more generally the spread of the pandemic in workplaces. And you can see it's dated the 27th of October 2020. Uh, on that first page, uh, the penultimate paragraph describes there some of the concerns that were articulated to the Minister for Communities, in particular regarding their inability to access um, national insurance numbers, which meant that they couldn't qualify for statutory sick pay when they became ill. Other difficulties faced included not being able to register with a GP, access free health services that they were entitled to, inability to open bank accounts if they could not provide proof of residence, and some were experiencing complications trying to register benefits for their families. Mr Murphy, were these um, concerns that, that you were aware of? Yes, they were. Um, the letter which my colleague Kevin Doherty wrote to Karen Nicole, the, the minister at the time, reflects the... the reflects concerns that were coming to us from the work which we were undertaking through the Migrant Support Unit, um, as the letter outlines. So that, that was a project, we, a European-funded project we were engaged in with a number of other partners called Crossing Borders and Breaking Boundaries. That was about um, addressing uh, or seeking to assist migrant workers uh, in the, the labour force of whom there were quite a number, 50,000 at the time, um, 23,000, almost 24,000 of whom came from the EU 26 and, and, the, and the remainder were basically people who came in from the rest of the world. Uh, what we discovered in that work, uh, so the project was about, as I said, um, addressing uh, you know, discrimination, um, uh, other issues that we're presenting here f for those individuals, exploitation and the like. Um, what we discovered was that what you're highlighting here was one issue. Um, so the absence of the national insurance numbers was having serious implications, like the inability to register for a GP at this point was, was lethal for some of these people. Um, the benefits not being able to access benefit was equally, you know, just very difficult for some families. Um, there was the issue of statutory sick pay, of course, as well, which some of them w weren't um, able to um, uh, qualify for. By the way, the statutory sick payment at that time was £94.25 a week. Um, it rose to a whole £95.85 by the end of the pandemic, completely inadequate in, in the modern world, not sufficient in any way to support a family um, or an, even an individual. Um, despite us, by the way, raising the issue of statutory sick pay a number of times separately with, with the government of Northern Ireland. So there was those two issues. There was also the issue uh, that... Um, these migrant workers um, were bringing to our attention around what they felt was um, disregard on the part of some employers for health and safety advice that was being provided to them, you know, from the public health agency and other people, including us. Mr. Uh, Murphy, I'm just going to stop you there. Um, uh, my lady, I've been asked if we can take uh, a short break, uh, and this would be a convenient moment to do so. Oh, well, the, the usual morning break? Um, I think, yes. Yeah. I think that would assist the stenographer, I'm sure. Uh, you were mid-sentence, Mr Murphy. Did you yeah. want to...? <laughs> I'm at, I'm I, at your Mr Murphy, direction. I think you were moving on to a matter I was going to consider in terms of health and safety in workplaces. So unless you, you wanted to say anything else, I think we can come back to that as I move, move along. Fair enough. Very well. Um, I shall return at half past 11. No. 
Thank you, my lady. Thank you, Mr Murphy. Before we took the break, we were looking at one particular area of concern for workers, um, and we looked at a letter sent by Kevin Doherty, uh, Doherty sorry, of the Migrant Workers Support Unit, which was in relation to national insurance numbers um, and what the widespread ramifications were of, of new workers on the front line who, who didn't have those. And that, as you expressed, that was just one particular issue that you were aware of as an organisation. Uh, one of the notable impacts of the pandemic was how it affected workplaces and those in frontline roles doing essential work. Um, those engaged in that sort of work tended to be in lower paid roles um, and tended to be already suffering with exacerbated health issues. And they, of course, couldn't work from home doing the essential work that they were. Agri-food was a sector of that kind that required people to be at their place of work. In doing that sort of work, how did it affect those who were part of that workforce uh, during the pandemic that, that you became aware of? What, what sort of issues were they facing? OK, well, that particular sector of the workforce tended to be... Um, tended to have a very high proportion of migrant workers in it. Um, so a lot of um, EU26 and a lot of rest of the world migrant workers working there. A lot of them actually working for agencies as well, which again lessened the protections available to them in, in our view. Um, the issues that, that they were facing in addition to those already outlined um, included um, struggling with the language, which made communication difficult. Um, it also, uh, they also felt, and were communicating to us, particularly through the Migrant Services Unit, that um, they were being, on occasion, misadvised around what their entitlements were. Um, they felt very strongly that the health and safety protections available to them weren't always uh, at a level which was entirely appropriate and indeed necessary. Um, they, uh, it became clear also in the course of, of our interactions with that community that the public health agency, for example, appeared to have a very poor data set around um, you know their vulnerabilities. Indeed, how many of them there were, and where they were located. We we wrote to them um, uh, and brought that to their attention. Um, and then, of course, the other issue was the the access to statutory sick pay and and um, uh, other um, in welfare entitlements. Can I just make a further point about statutory sick pay? It, it had a number of I wouldn't. Well, there were a number of consequences which flowed from that very low rate of statutory sick pay, which I think w would be of interest in the inquiry. F the first of those was that because it was so low, um, it meant that, that a lot of workers felt they had no option, even though they were sick, but go to work. The consequences of that were that um, the risk to their fellow uh, workers in, in, the, in their place of work increased, um, so the virus spread further. But it spread beyond the workplace because these workers, because it was asymptomatic, of course, these workers were taking the virus home with them, so it was it was spreading out beyond that. Um, I, I do I seem to recall Dr. McBride may, may have made a similar, or may have made that point as well in, in, in his evidence, I think, the in his evidence to this module. Uh, or, or perhaps a module one, I can't exactly recall, there's so much paper here. Uh, so, the, in the, the agri-food sector, manufacturing, service industries and retail, um, you had very high concentrations of low-paid and migrant workers. Uh, and as I previously pointed out there, a very large part of the 400 people who lost their lives were in those particular sectors. The, 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 
the 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 migrant popul the migrant worker population there um, in in the agri food was largely U twenty six in nature, um, in origin rather, um, and one of those um, workers in particular um, lost his life in a Moy Park in a Moy Park processing plant in Dungannon in in County Tyrone in very early uh, 2020, in March of 2020, yeah. uh, I believe. The senior Unite the Union official in the north here, since retired, Jackie Pollock wrote to the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, um, and indeed the, the copied in the Minister for the Economy, I believe, um, raising concerns which Unite the Union had, which reflect the concerns which we have been reflecting as a Congress on behalf of all the unions to the same people. Um, you know, uh, and Jackie Pollock in his letter was uh, on behalf of Unite the Union, uh, on the workers' behalf, was um, making the point that, he, that there should be mass testing in that sector. That never happened. Um, that there should be more unannounced inspections. That didn't happen either. Um, and that, you know, there was, they felt, United the Union felt, and, and we shared this view up to a point as well, that there was some willful disregarding of the advice on the part of some people, uh, some of the employers. Um, so there was, a, interestingly, those workers, you know, working in those processing plants um, were particularly at risk, um, as were those who were in front-facing occupations such as retail. You know, that was the other big proportion of those 400 lives that were lost that I referred to. Um, I think that was 12, over 12% 12 of, of that 400 were in retail and service. Um, Interestingly, that there, there's a couple of things about that number which I think we're looking at as well. The first of those is that the, those were, by and large, um, rest of the world migrant and low-paid workers, uh, so not EU 26. Um, and we believe that a very high proportion of those people were actually women. And the disproportionate impact of this virus on women, in particular in those low paid and migrant um, sectors of the economy, is something which we feel has been completely under investigated and underreported, possibly. Um, we, unfortunately, while there are some general figures from the Northern Ireland. Um, Health and Safety Executive. Um, we don't have very uh, complete sets of data from them, so it's impossible to tell it. But we in Congress or ICTU um, are of the view that that's certainly an area which which bears further examination. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Um, would it be fair to say, um, f f from all that you've said, that those on the front line and in lower paid roles w were left behind? I think that's. Uh, I think that that is um, a fair enough description here. Um, and left behind, that is despite the very huge efforts on the part of their trade union representatives um, and belatedly on the part of the, the, the government, if you like, um, and the employers too, in fairness. Um, but I think help such as it was when it came to that sector of the, the labour force was too late, the harm had already been done. Mr Murphy, I just want to raise um, or explore another concern, which was in relation to the impact of the pandemic on black, Asian and minority ethnic people. Uh, in particular, there was a lack of specific data on the actual impact that the that COVID was having on these groups and migrant worker communities in Northern Ireland. There was a letter sent to um, the Health Minister, Robin Swan, uh, on the 28th of October, 2020, 
in which a request was made for ethnicity and occupation to be recorded in COVID-19 data collection systems for health and social care in Northern Ireland. The uh, letter was responded to, um, and the Health Minister, Robin Swan, articulated that that work was underway and recognised the need for it. Um, how important was it to have such data, and was that then included in the data collection systems? Um, the letter that you're referring to um, reflects the concerns which my colleague Kevin Doherty had, had previously articulated in his communication as well. Um, it was very important, we felt, that this data would be collected. Um, simply because these workers were in the lowest paid um, occupations. They were in what we now know, but we suspected at the time to be the highest risk occupations. Um, we also know that they were living in the most deprived communities and the figures then and now confirm that you know they were at two thirds you know, uh, two thirds more risk, for example, than those that were living in the best or in the least deprived areas. Um, the so the collection of of basic data, like how many people, black uh, ethnic minority people, are we talking about here? You know, where are they located? Um, what age? You know what age groups are they falling into? All of this would have greatly assisted and informed a response, a more targeted and more complete response, not only for working people who we primarily represent, but also for their families and indeed the community as a whole. So, um, was it fed in? I'm not entirely sure. Um, to be quite honest with you, I haven't seen uh, where it was fed in. All I can tell you is that I know that both it, our experience of, of the PHA's data, as you know, articulated by Kevin Doherty in, in his communication, and um, our experience of the Health and Safety Executive ANI, and indeed confirmed by the HSE ANI's own evidence to this module, um, would suggest that those data sets are less complete than might have been optimum. Thank you. Mr Murphy, one of the particular issues that this module is considering is the absencing, absence of a functioning executive, so between um, the three years preceding the pandemic 2017 to January 2020. Um, in, in your view, how did um, the absence of a functioning executive impact the response to the pandemic, but in particular in relation to the interests of workers? Um, I, I, I think the absence of a functioning uh, executive um, was was extremely negative um, to the experience of workers during COVID. Um, first of all, the absence of the executive meant, well, it was a failure of political, political leadership in our view. Um, on top of that, um, it meant that vital workplace intelligence and workforce intelligence wasn't made available directly to you know the key decision makers. Um, indeed, once the assembly was or the executive was restored in January of twenty and until it, it up until the period when it collapsed again in early of twenty two, um, we weren't successful in getting a meeting with the office of the first and first or deputy first ministers during that that period. It also impacted, it undermined already fragile political relationships and, and, and threatened community cohesion right at the very wrong time for, uh, for everyone. It impacted negatively on policy making um, and on policy development. So for example, during this period, immediately preceding this period, you had the publication of Ben Goa, 
the big Goa reporting to the health service, um, and and the very necessary reforms there, which you know had come about as a consequence of underfunding demographic changes and other pressures, historical and otherwise, on the on, on system. So there was nobody and no executive to enact those necessary changes. So it meant, for example, that the health service going into the pandemic was, a, was struggling. Um, you know, um, Robin Swan, I think, said operating on a hand-to-mouth basis. I, I don't think I could disagree with that. Um, further to that, then, the fact that there was no executive meant that a very dire public finance situation couldn't really be addressed. So we we lurched from one annual budget to the next annual budget. There was no strategic planning in financial terms over the piece which had allowed uh, you know some effort to be made to address um, clear inadequacies and deficiencies across the, the entirety of the public services not only health Thank you. Mr Murphy, I just want to end on this note by looking ahead. You refer in your witness statement to the Fire Brigades Union, who have um, a tripartite arrangement in place. They represent firefighters across the UK. Um, and the arrangement that they have, which applies in Northern Ireland, is, is one which they work with employers and fire officers. In your view, how successful is this? And would you recommend a similar arrangement um, for the Northern Ireland Committee of ICTU and the executive? I think what you're pointing to is one of the things that we need to do going forward. And yes, it was extremely successful. You can tell it was successful. The, the evidence for its success is the fact that right across the British Isles, not one single fire member of the fire and rescue service lost their lives during this period um, as a result of the virus. Um, it's a tripartite arrangement that they entered, that the Fire Brigade Union have entered into with their employers and with the chief fire officers. It meant that when the pandemic kicked in, they were able to implement system-wide uh, mitigations, which worked extremely effectively in preventing um, any disruption to either cover or, you know, the health of individual fire firefighters. So it was pretty, uh, it's a pretty effective uh, approach and one which we would certainly advocate, but it's only one and it needs to be replicated, we believe, at a, at a system-wide, economy-wide, government-wide level, you know, this tripartite approach. Um, you know, we began actually with this um, when you, your very first question was about the engagement forum. I'm suggesting that that model or a model very similar to that is essential going forward. Um, other things I think which we, we, we would really want to consider here is, you know, an active inclusion of the worker's voice in the planning going forward for future pandemic scenarios in the hope, of course, that we never find ourselves back there. But I think it would be essential that the worker's voice would be included in any planning for that. Additionally, we need to address some of the, some of the other issues, the issues around sick pay, around access to services and benefits, particularly from those who are new to our country, who come from other places. Um, we need to be more considerate of that. And we, you know, the other thing I think which we need to do is be a lot kinder um, to those that we work with more generally. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. My lady, those are all the questions I have. Um, I understand there are no uh, pre-approved Rule 10s and neither have any come in during the course of the evidence. Thank you, Mr. Noah. Thank you very much for your help, Mr. Murphy. Thank you.
My lady, may I call the next witness, please, Sir David Sterling? I do solemnly. I do solemnly. Sincerely and truly. Sincerely and truly. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you. So, David, I don't know if you had to make significant changes to your arrangements, but if you did, thank you very much for coming forward early. Not at all, my lady. Could I ask you to give your full name to the inquiry, please? Uh, it's David Sterling. And I think, uh, I know, Sir David, you have said that you would rather not be referred to as Sir David, but I think it's only right that we do refer to you by your formal title That's in fine. these proceedings. Um, could I ask you to just look in front of you? I think there's a witness statement there that you signed on the 20th of March, 2024. Yes. And can you confirm that the contents of that statement are true to the best of your knowledge and belief? I can, yes. Thank you. Um, so, David, there's quite a lot to get through this morning, and we are going to go to some documents as well. If at any point I refer to a document that I haven't gone to, or if at any point you need me to slow down um, so that you can properly read something, will you please say? Um, I think it's right that you became the head of the civil service in Northern Ireland in 2017. That's, that's right, in the uh, 17th of June, I think it was. And I think it's, that was at a point whenever the power sharing arrangements were under suspension. Is that's that correct. correct. And in fact, it wasn't until 2020, until they were resumed, that you became head of civil service with a functioning executive committee. That's correct, on the 11th of January 2020. And um, just in terms of your general role then, I think it's threefold. First of all, you act as, or you acted as, principal advisor to the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. Yes. Right. I'll come back to that. You were also head of the executive office, is that correct? That's correct. And can you just tell me this, does that have an analogue, so to speak, at Westminster, or is it something very specific to Northern Ireland? It would have some similarities to the Cabinet Office and maybe to Number 10, but in many respects it would be different. Um, Sorry, I, I didn't mean to, to stop you. Can you just help us then with what the overlap might be in terms of the Cabinet Office or what, what it shares in terms of its functions with the Cabinet Office? Well, yes, I would... Uh, in my role, I would have performed many of the functions that would have been carried out by the Cabinet Secretary, um, and, but I would have had an overarching responsibility for the Northern Ireland Civil Service, um, which was perhaps a little different to the role that the Cabinet Secretary would have had. Certainly for uh, some periods of time, the management of the Civil Service in Whitehall would have been carried out by a different person. Um, and the Cabinet Office would have had a different um, set of responsibilities compared with the Executive Office in Northern Ireland. And can you just help me then with what the main differences might be with the Cabinet Office and, and the TEO? Um, your, uh, my knowledge of the Cabinet Office today is, is a little limited, but certainly the Cabinet Office would have had responsibility for uh, coordinating certain actions against, uh, sort of across uh, Whitehall, uh, which we wouldn't necessarily have had uh, in the executive office. The executive office's broad responsibilities were uh, providing support to the executive. Um, there were then a range of functions which had been accumulated in the executive office over the years to do with maintaining good relations, um, and a variety of other things as well. All right. And then can you help me with what parts of the executive office might overlap with Downing Street as well, or the Downing... I think you said that there, there was some overlap with Cabinet Office, some overlap with something analogous to Downing Street. Could you help me with Well, that? I suppose in, in number 10, they would be providing support to the Prime Minister, and you would have had a secretariat there that would... Um, and you would have had communications um, uh, facilities, if you like, uh, su support 
for the Prime Minister and we had in the Executive Office, we had obviously an Executive Secretariat which would have been preparing, sorry, performing similar roles and we had the Executive Information Services which was responsible for providing communication support to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister but also to the other departments as well. All right, so is the principal difference then th that lack, as it were, of cross-departmental overreach or coordination? Uh, yes, that would be the main difference. Uh, and obviously, um, the administration in Northern Ireland is a multi-party executive, um, whereas in recent times, um, you know, the Prime Minister has normally command, you know, commanded a government from the same party. I think the exception would have been the uh, Lib Dem Conservative um, uh, coalition between 2010 and 2015. All right. I'm going to come back to that issue of cross-departmental control, but I think you, you, you've just referred really to your third function, which was head of the civil service, and I'm going to come back as to the distinct role of civil servants in Northern Ireland. But if we can just focus for a moment on that departmental issue, you deal with it at paragraph six of your statement, but can I just check, please, that I have it right? So in Northern Ireland, each governmental department is headed by its minister and it's the minister essentially who has autonomy or who has control over that department and the permanent secretary of that department is accountable to the minister is that right and only the minister uh, that is broadly correct um, the department's order 1999 and it's section four um, requires or provides that the Permanent second, sorry, that uh, the department is at all times under the direction and control of its minister. Um, where the head of the civil service might have influence over departments would be if, for example, there's a program for government in place. And if you have a program for government which has been agreed by the executive, it would be expected that the head of the civil service would uh, hold permanent secretaries to account for the delivery of the commitments which fall to particular departments um, within that programme for government. But as head of the civil service, I would have no powers of direction over the permanent secretaries in the other eight departments. All right. I'm going to come back to how that operated in the context of the pandemic. Um, so really, there, there are two issues then. You, you can't direct permanent secretaries, correct? That's Save for the circumstances in which you've just mentioned yes. when it comes to programme for government. And equally, is it right that the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister, that they can't direct the Minister either, that they effectively have operational control over their department? Um, do you mean the First Minister and Deputy First, First Minister obviously have direction control over the Executive Office? Yeah, no, sorry, forgive me if I if um, I confused you. No, in terms of their... Con or do they have control over departments might be the, the most simple way to put it. Um, not, uh, not in a strict legal terms, but obviously as First and Deputy First Minister, um, they um, would have influence over the other departments um, and uh, you know again if there's a program for government in place they as the sort of co-chairs of the executive committee will have again that influence um, that sits within the executive committee. I'm going to take you in due course to an email exchange that relates to the deputy first minister and, and indeed the first minister where there is a, certainly a sense of them feeling impotent, and that's my words, not, not the words in the email, in terms of their ability to control um, what was the, the, the Department of Health during the pandemic. Um, and there is reference in that email to the operational independence of the health minister. Is that an accurate way of putting it, that effectively they are operationally independent? of the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister? Uh, yes, they, they would. Each departmental minister would have a certain degree of independence, but obviously um, there is a requirement that any matters which are cross-cutting, in other words, which affect more than one department, 
uh, which are novel or contentious. Um, you know, any issues like that which would require a decision, uh, there's a requirement that they be brought to the executive committee. So in that sense, you know, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have a degree of control over issues which, as I say, are cross-cutting, novel or contentious. But on issues which fall entirely within the remit of a department, then individual ministers do have a certain discretion. All right, we'll come back and look at that sure. perhaps in context. I'm just going to go back, if I may, to the composition of the executive then, which formed in January 2020. You obviously had ministers from five different parties, correct? <clears throat> Three of those ministers were from minority parties, so to speak. I think five of the ten of them didn't have any ministerial responsibility at all. Is that also correct? That's my that recollection, mistake. yes. And I assume in addition to all of that, these were individuals who obviously weren't used to working with each other in that context either. They wouldn't have been used to working with each other within that sort of executive um, framework, but they all knew each other. Um, you know, Northern Ireland's a small place politically, and a lot of them would uh, obviously have known the other ministers pretty well, and some might have worked indeed in, in councils together, and that sort of thing. All right. Again, we'll come back and just look at how the committee actually operated. Um, when we get past January 2020, I just want to stick on some general principles or issues at the moment, if I may. Um, you've said out in your statement that the concept of collective cabinet responsibility just doesn't have application to the executive committee. Is that right? That's correct. It doesn't apply in the same way that it would in uh, Westminster. And that's effectively because there is no government of the day, so to speak, whom everyone serves, correct? Yes, and I think it's also in recognition of the fact that um, our form of government, which is uh, a, a mandatory coalition, um, it would be more difficult to apply that type of collective uh, responsibility. I think the concept of collective responsibility breaks down into two parts. The first part of it is that all discussions in Cabinet are confidential, and there's an expectation that what's discussed around the Cabinet table will stay confidential between, between um, ministers. That's the first part of it. And the second, that once a position has been agreed in Cabinet, that all ministers are expected to abide by whatever decision is made. I think you're not, and I see you're familiar with that, with those two key characteristics. Yes. So can I just first of all ask you about the requirement of confidentiality? And look at that in terms of the ministerial pledge of office that's taken in Northern Ireland. Is there again an analogue to that part of collective cabinet responsibility? Yes, whilst we don't have collective cabinet responsibility in the sort of Whitehall Westminster sense, um, there is a requirement within the ministerial code that ministers do not criticise uh, decisions taken by the executive outside the executive. Uh, there would also be a requirement that um, papers which are submitted to the executive uh, are not uh, disclosed outside. They should remain confidential <coughs> to members of the executive. We'll see, or, or um, it's quite clear from the minutes of the meeting, that there's constant reference to leaking. And, ref and this is during executive committee meetings, just to be clear, and reference, for example, to discussions being tweeted as they're happening as well, obviously by parties external. Is that, was that a normal feature of executive committee meetings in other times, in other words, outside the pandemic, or was that something very specific to the pandemic? Certainly, uh, discussions I've had with my predecessors going back uh, a number of years back, and even to the first executive back in 1999-2000, uh, there has been a persistent problem of papers being leaked. Um, it, it's probably fair to say that the problem has got worse in more recent times, particularly um, when we have uh, you know, mobile phones with cameras, um, when we have social media, 
uh, that sort of thing. Um, I, I think I don't have any hard evidence to show that there has been an increase, but certainly the perception amongst my former colleagues would be that the problem has become more difficult in recent times. I mean, the reason why it exists is obviously so that there can be full and frank discussions um, between ministers without fear of, of it being put into the public domain. Does it or did it have an inhibiting effect during the pandemic that ministers couldn't trust that that principle would hold? I think there was a there was a practical um, impact, and that was uh, I would have detected uh, a tendency amongst ministers bringing papers to the executive to submit them as late as possible. Um, just to reduce the chance that they would leak. Um, and that, of course, creates difficulties for other ministers who maybe were not getting papers until very close to the start of the meeting, even right up to the actual uh, due time that a meeting was uh, meant to start. Uh, and yes, I think there probably was an inhibiting um, uh, factor as well, you know, that. Um, ministers were reluctant to bring forward items which were extremely sensitive. But that, that did have a real consequence, didn't it, during executive committee meetings during the pandemic? Because quite often, um, I think it was ministers Long and Mallon, for example, wouldn't have had the papers until quite late in the day. And sometimes that, needed, that meant that meetings, for example, had to be adjourned, even if they were quite urgent. Uh, it didn't happen on all occasions, but no. it did happen fairly regularly that um, uh, some minister would, ministers would say, I think with justification, that they hadn't had sufficient time to uh, read the papers and that there would then have been an agreed adjournment. And, uh, and, and in fairness, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister were usually uh, quite happy to concede such adjournments, although it obviously did make... Uh, it make, made it harder to do business efficiently. All right. I'm just going to come back, if I may, to just some of the more constitutional issues, um, Sir David. Um, I think one of the things I think you suggest in your witness statement, and certainly the, the experts in Module 2C suggest, is that the departmental structure in Northern Ireland means that ministers are often quite reluctant to confront difficult decisions. And I think because they get fixed with the difficult decision as opposed to colleagues in a cabinet or a government being fixed with a difficult decision. Is that right? That would be my clear perception uh, and my experience is that um, there is a reluctance, in my view, amongst all the political parties to do things which they would perceive would have a, a negative, give rise to a negative public reaction. Uh, and that could be uh, you know, the reconfiguration of a public service such as health or education. Um, there has been, a, I think, a, a reluctance in the past to do some things which you know, reviews, strategic reviews and other things have suggested need to be done. Um, so yes, I, I, I have seen that. Uh, All right. One of the issues that's probably going to be quite important, um, certainly in the course of your evidence, is the suggestion, again, by some of the witnesses and by the experts in Module 2C, that departments in Northern Ireland did operate in quite a compartmentalised way. Um, and that there were a number of reasons for that. I'm, I'm going to ask you about the reasons in a moment, but can I just ask whether or not you agree with that observation that has been made? Uh, I agree with it to an extent, but what I would say um, in the early weeks of the new administration, um, one of the immediate tasks was to prepare a programme for government. We hadn't had a programme for government since the one that applied between 2012 and 2016. And Can I, sorry, I'm just conscious and I'm, I apologise for interrupting you, but it's probably sensible if you explain what a programme for government oh, sorry. Yes. is. I assume it's something akin to a manifesto that's agreed between uh, the... A, a programme for government in simple terms is a plan and it is a 
plan which the executive would agree for a period of usually three years or more. Uh, and it, 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 it should usually contain a statement of what the executive's priorities are, what the commitments and actions it, is, uh, it, it has agreed to take over that three-year period. And ideally, it should be linked to a budget. So in other words, there should be a clear linkage which shows how the commitments which are set out in the programme for government are, are going to be paid for in very simple terms. Now, I think the point I was going to make in those Sorry. early weeks was that I actually did detect a strong desire amongst the new ministerial team to work together. Um, I think they clearly felt that after three, a three-year absence, um, they needed to step up. They recognised that there was a lack of public confidence in the institutions. And, for example, we held two away days, one in January, one in February, where we were exploring what would need to go into the next programme for government. And I was quite impressed with the sort of collegiality that was on view on those two days. Um, unfortunately, the onset of COVID meant that we were actually never able to translate all that preliminary work into a programme for government at, at that particular time. All right. So, is essentially what you're saying is that if there if there is a tendency, or if these departments have have quite a lot of autonomy and independence, nonetheless, that ability to work together is something that can that can occur, and it's just a question of willingness on the part of the ministers to to overcome any of those. Yes, willingness. I think is 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 a very good word, and and what I would have found is that a lot would have depended on the personality of individual ministers um, and the extent to which people had built relationships with each other, which crossed maybe party boundaries. But as I say, in those early weeks, I was quite encouraged by what I was seeing. All right. Well, I mean, obviously, the fundamental question is whether or not that willingness held up as time progressed. But, but perhaps if, again, I can just stick to some of the really fundamental constitutional issues and then we'll revisit that. I wanted to ask you, and again, it's an important point about the role of civil servants then in Northern Ireland and their distinct position from counterparts um, in Westminster. And again, I wonder if you could help me with that, that this idea that what distinguishes the civil servant in Northern Ireland is that part of their role being to help maintain or to facilitate power sharing or to mediate um, political relationships. C could you explain a bit more about that and whether you agree with it, of course? Yeah, I, I, I don't. I'm not sure anything is written down which makes that a clear responsibility of Northern Ireland civil servants. You know, at its simplest level, we are there under the direction and control of our ministers to serve our ministers to the best of our ability. But certainly, uh, custom and practice, you know, going back 24 years to the first executive post the Good Friday Agreement, there was always a strong sense amongst the civil service that our role was to help make the institutions work. Uh, you know, recognising that you know, a mandatory five part, four or five party coalition is inherently more difficult form of government to manage than, say, a single party type of government that you would usually see uh, in London. Um, so. There wasn't a sort of set of tools or, or, or levers that we would pull to do this, but I think we all, in our own way, felt that we had a responsibility to uh, encourage ministers to work together um, within the framework of the programme for government, etc. But presumably, then, a key part of your role is that idea of forging compromise so that you can get all of the parties fundamentally to agree at common positions with each other. Uh, yes, certainly, and, and, and my own experience over the years in different departments, um, I, I would have always um, sought important to work across departmental boundaries. And the reality is, uh, on most occasions, ministers are, are willing to do that. I think sometimes this <coughs> idea that ministers operate in departmental silos is a little overstated. 
in my experience, the ministers I worked with was that they were keen to work across boundaries. And there are practical reasons for that, and that is that there are very few things that ministers want to do that they can do solely within the powers and responsibilities that they have within their own department. If you look at the big issues, the big challenges in Northern Ireland, most of them require a cross-departmental response. So, yes, at times you would see people retreating into departmental silos, but it wasn't, that wasn't something that was always evident. All right. I just wanted to come back to the point that you made in your witness statement, this idea that sometimes the need for compromise could drive decision-making towards the lowest common denominator. Is that right? I mean, those are your words. Uh, yes, that unfortunately was evident. Um, uh, and it would be particularly evident where um, we were maybe... Um, let me think. I think of an example. Um, let's say in the executive office, uh, issues around culture, language, etc., um, could be quite difficult. And what you might tend to see is um, it would be difficult to get agreement on a way forward on issues of that sense of nature, you know, flags, symbols, emblems, all that type of thing. Um, that would require quite a bit of effort to try and find common ground. And, you know, I think history shows that on occasion that common ground simply cannot be found. Uh, on other issues, what you might find is that um, one party, and I'm talking about the executive office again, which you know, in my time, we'd always been, um, we'd always had a sort of Sinn Féin DUP partnership there. Um, you, you might have found that um, a difficult thing for one party might be conceded if a difficult thing for the other party was, uh, you know, traded, if you like. Okay, so it's a sort of bargaining process. Bargaining then, process you would get. Up. So. Uh, you know, what you would find is that the difficult issues, um, uh, they, they, they might just not be agreed, or it might be that they were agreed on the basis that something else was being agreed. Right. I'm going to move on then to a, a, a distinct topic, which is the absence of ministers between 2017 and 2020. And I think you've been candid in your witness statement, as I think you've been before, and um, before the inquiry about the impact that that had on public services in particular in Northern Ireland up until the eve of the pandemic. Is that right? Uh, yes, I, I felt that I had to be candid about this. Um, when I came to uh, the executive office in June 2017, the um, ministers had been away for um, six months or so. Nobody thought it would last much longer than that. And uh, there were political talks that summer. There were high hopes that would reach the conclusion. Didn't prove to be the case. Uh, and I would have said regularly in my role at the time that I thought this was um, uh, totally unacceptable that civil servants were being left to operate, to, to, you know, to run a government without the direction and control that would normally be expected from ministers. Um, I, I never believed at that stage that it would be allowed to go on for three years. And I said at the time, I can't imagine in any other part of the United Kingdom that such a thing would have been allowed to prevail. Uh, nonetheless, it did. Um, but it has had consequences. And the fact that you know, we had that three-year hiatus and then another three year, sorry, another two year hiatus, which only ended earlier this year in February, has in my view left um, public services in a very bad state. I talked about stagnation and decay. Yes. But I think the problems that you're seeing in particularly our health service and in our education services, but in pretty much all our other services are to a large extent, in part down to the fact that for five years out of the last seven, we have not had ministerial direction. I just want to go back to the period before the onset of the pandemic in January 2020. 
the inquiry is aware that obviously there had been a number of papers advocating radical reform in Northern Ireland health services and in particularly the, the in particular the Bengoa report. I mean, first of all, was that need for radical? Was there a need for radical reform? Was that an imperative before 2020? Uh, yes, very much so. And in fact, in my witness statement, I uh, have set out an extract from Fiscal Council's report, on a sustainability report they did on the health service. And that actually itemises a number of strategic reviews which have been carried out in the health service going back, I think, maybe 30 or 40 years. And there's been a common theme to a lot of those reports. Basically, they are suggesting that the health service needs to be reconfigured, that there needs to be greater focus given to primary care, uh, that there needs to be the collection of specialisms in uh, specialised units, you know, a, a range of things like that. Uh, and sadly, um, that transformation has not happened. And the Bengoa report is now eight years old. So I think there are two aspects to that. I think the first question is whether or not, in your view, the state that services had reached prior to January 2020, whether or not that conditioned in part the response to the pandemic thereafter. Um, I think the, the, the absence of ministers um, for those three years left the health service in a weaker position than it ideally would have been in to deal with a pandemic. Now, I would much prefer to defer to my Department of Health colleagues to talk about that in, uh, in more detail, uh, because you know, my knowledge um, wouldn't be as good as theirs. And uh, obviously, I'm now three and a half years yes. retired as well. So I, I wouldn't want to be seen as an authority on just how bad things were in the health service. But I, I don't think it would be an understatement to say that the health service, that uh, the neglect it had suffered uh, for three years, left it less well prepared to deal with the pandemic than it otherwise should have been. All right. And just uh, there's a second part to the question, which is obviously when power sharing then resumed in January 2020, <coughs> It was with all of the work that had accrued over the previous three years that required ministerial decision making, presumably. Um, and I take it that's what your programme of for government was intended then to address in that first year. Is that right? Yes. And, and again, in fairness, there was, uh, as, as I've already said, I, I detected a, a really strong willingness amongst ministers to tackle some of these big issues. And also worth noting that um, we had the new decade, new approach uh, agreement um, in place that contained some uh, financial resources to help address some of the problems in the health service. Uh, and it contained commitments as well to address some of the particular challenges facing the health service at the time. So, you know, that was a piece of work which needed to be developed and taken forward. And I saw that as something that would sit alongside the development of a new program for government. And I would have seen those two things being brought together as a means of addressing the big structural challenges in the health service and indeed in other services as well. All right. And I think one of the issues that's linked to that was that there had previously been an absence of multi-year budgets as well. Is that correct? Yes, we uh, we hadn't had a... The last programme for government had been agreed in March 2012. The last multi-year budget had been agreed in the previous year, 2011. Now, the absence of multi-year budgets in Northern Ireland wasn't solely down to issues here. Um, there would have been quite a number of years where the Treasury would not have produced... Um, uh, spending reviews, you know, spanning more than one year. So there, there had been a number of single-year budgets um, in Whitehall, which 
It obviously meant that Northern Ireland couldn't produce a multi-year budget either. And the consequence of that is simply your, your ability to pre-plan any reforms is limited because you can only say this is what we can do in the year to come. Well, indeed. And if you're looking at big, complex services like the health service or like education, uh, it is much more difficult to plan if you only know what your, you know, what your financial um, envelope is going to be for the next year. Uh, and indeed, one of the other problems we've had uh, in recent years has been that we haven't even had single-year budgets agreed well in advance of the start of the financial year. And that makes it incredibly hard for those who are running public services to uh, manage um, those services. Like, for example, the budget for 24-25 has just been agreed by the executive, and we're at the beginning of May. Right. That idea or the understanding about the fragility of the health service in January 2020, was that one of the principal concerns then of the executive committee? I mean, was that one of the key issues that needed to be addressed at the start of that year? Yes, I would have said at the start of uh, 2020, the problems in the health service would have been considered by pretty much all ministers as one of their top priorities, if not the top priority. We had had um, strikes in the health service, which had just been settled in part due to the finances that were put forward in the New Decade, New Approach package. But we also uh, were, we were seeing very high waiting lists, uh, which again, I think there was a clear desire to tackle. So uh, that, you know, th those issues, and then the knowledge that the Ben Gore report was sitting on the shelf waiting to be taken forward would have been at the front of, I think, all ministers' minds in uh, January, February 2020. And as the pandemic started to unfold in January and February 2020, do you think that there was cognizance or thought about the extent to which the fragility of the health service might actually be a really important thing for the entire executive committee or the executive office to also think about in terms of what was unfolding? Yeah, I, I think the I think there would have been a recognition, there would have been an understanding that, uh, particularly as we got to understand the nature of the coronavirus, that the health service would be under particular stress, and that that stress would, in a sense, have been exacerbated by the structural problems which had built up over a number of years. And I think in your witness statement, but forgive me if I'm wrong about this. I think you say that that, that understanding crystallised in and around the start of March. Is that right? Yes, I think that's fair. All right. I'm going to come back and ask you about yep. that in more detail. Um, just again, I'm going to move on to ask you about civil contingency arrangements. But before I do, I think one of the other things that is suggested by the Module 2C experts is that not having had ministers in place before January 2020 also meant that they hadn't been able to develop relationships with counterparts either in Westminster or in the Republic of Ireland as well. And I, I wanted to ask you from your experience whether or not those kind of relationships those individual relationships are actually important and matter in government in Northern Ireland? They are important. Um, their importance will vary depending on the particular uh, portfolio that a minister has. Um, so, if, for example, if I take the Minister for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, um, you know, just given the history, uh, you know, our history in the EU and then having now left the EU, um, there would have been a very close relationship between uh, local agriculture and environment ministers and the DEFRA minister in, uh, in Westminster. Um, there would equally have been strong relationships in that regard on a north-south Belf uh, sorry, Belfast-Dublin basis as well. Um, other ministers 
uh, sorry, other departments would have <coughs> relationships as well. Like, for example, the economy minister would have had strong relationships with the economy departments in, in London uh, and perhaps in, in, in Dublin as well. Um, a lot would have depended, sorry, the, the extent to which those relationships were developed would have de depended, in my experience, on the personality of the individual minister, but also their party affiliation. I see. So, and in effect, I don't want to simplify this, but that you would expect those politicians who were of a nationalist background to more naturally want to foster relationships with counterparts in the Republic and vice versa? Or is that too simplistic? Um, it's, it's not too simplistic. Um, it, it wouldn't completely accurately portray what was actually happening. Um, there would have been that tendency that, you know, na na ministers from a nationalist background would have looked to Dublin, unionist ministers would have looked to, uh, to London. But there would have been plenty of examples where that didn't hold entirely. And there would have been examples I can think of, of unionist ministers having very strong relationships, for example, with um, their health counterparts in Dublin. Um, and equally, uh, you know, I can think of uh, examples where, say, a Sinn Féin agriculture minister would have had a good relationship with a DEFRA minister in, in London. So there's an element of truth to it, but it, it's, not. it's, yeah. So there's probably a pragmatic consideration, first of all, and then a question of willingness again on the other. Yes, and, and I suppose it goes back to one of my earlier points, is that um, ministers in wanting to do things um, will often find that they need the cooperation of people in London and Dublin or even Cardiff and Edinburgh and that you know, whatever their party affiliations, they will uh, build relationships with that aim in mind. And before I leave this topic then, can I ask you about the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister role and ordinarily or whether it mattered here um, that those relationships didn't exist prior to January 2020 um, in terms of counterparts with the Republic of Ireland and Westminster as well. So that, that was a clumsily put question, but I suppose what I'm asking you is whether or not they hadn't had an opportunity to establish relationships with their counterparts, whether or not that mattered. Um, I'm not sure that would be a major issue because you take the First and Deputy First Minister in January 2020, Michelle O'Neill and Arlene Foster, they would have known each other very well. They were both ministers in previous executives. Um, they would have known their counterparts in Dublin pretty well through the talks processes that had gone on over, on and off over the previous three years. So um, the, the personalities would have been known. Um, there would have been relationships there um, which could have been built on. What you wouldn't have had would have been the relationships that you would expect to deliver you know, from pe two people who were uh, responsible for similar portfolios in different jurisdictions. That obviously would require a bit more development. And can I just ask you again then, coming back to January 2020, what the, the state of general relationships were like, and, and I'm referring here to ministers, in terms of their Republic of Ireland <coughs> counterparts, or if it's possible to characterise the relationship generally or not? Um, it looked at, let, let's say, the health, two health departments, I think, my understanding was that the Northern Ireland Health Minister fairly quickly established a good working relationship with his counterpart in the South. Now, I stand to be corrected by Robin Swan if that's not the case, but that was my understanding. I know certainly as we moved through the year, the relationship between the two departments at both official and ministerial level was good. Um, if you look at the First Minister and Deputy First Minister, um, again, uh, the relationship between the First Minister, um, Arlene Foster at the time, and uh, the Dublin administration, uh, 
on a personal level, um, uh, I think Arlene Foster got on pretty well with Leo Varadkar and with Simon Coveney. But at a political level, there would have been tensions there. Um, Can I just, is that because of EU exit? Yes, it would have been over EU exit. And, um, and again, I'm, I'm sort of wary about making sort of passing comment on, on, on these issues. Um, but my sense would be that there would have been uh, yeah, a, a, a good working relationship between the Deputy First Minister and the Taoiseach at the time. But then you've got to bear in mind that uh, the political um, the political arithmetic in Dublin is also a, f a factor there, you know, given Sinn Féin's growing strength in, uh, yes. in Ireland. So a complicating factor was the fact that Sinn Féin were an oppositional party to the government in Dublin Correct. at the same time. Correct. And I think we, we might see that play out then a bit later in events in the pandemic when Northern Ireland is perhaps not informed about steps that the Republic of Ireland is taking in response to the pandemic. Yes, um, although I think those party differences um, as we've moved into the pandemic were of less relevance. Um, uh, you know, they, they were less evident to me than the differences that might have occurred between what was being done north and south. All right. I'm going to move on then, if I may, to ask you about the, um, some of the arrangements for civil contingencies in Northern Ireland. And I think we've got 10 minutes before lunch, so let's see if we can fit those in. Um, I wonder if I could ask to be brought up on screen, please. INQ 00009-2739. And I think you've said, Sir David, in your witness statement that you were familiar with this protocol. Um, and you've referred to it in your witness statement. Can I just check there? Was, was this the, the key protocol from the perspective of the TEO that would guide the response to the pandemic? Uh, yes, that'll be correct. All right, and if we can see that it's dated September 2016, if we could just go to the first page of it. That's page three, sorry. So we can see from this that this protocol applies. First of all, at paragraph one, Sir David, when an emergency has occurred or is anticipated, which is likely to have a serious impact either on part of the whole of Northern Ireland, yes? And then yes. it sets out that the arrangements can be activated as required. And then the first bullet point is to provide strategic coordination of the response or recovery across Northern Ireland departments. So just looking at paragraph one, obviously the emergency doesn't have to have eventuated, <coughs> does it? It can be an anticipated emergency, something that's coming down the line. No, certainly uh, if you're dealing with a contingency, uh, whether it's one that is happening or one that's emerging, you would normally go through a process where there is a prepare phase then a response phase, then a recovery phase. Yes. Um, so in early January, February, we would have been very much in the prepare phase. Um, but nonetheless guided by this protocol. Yes, absolutely. Right. So this protocol does apply whenever you're at that prepare yes. phase. All right. And if we look at paragraph two, I'm just mentioning this because we'll hear plenty of reference to it. The arrangements were known as NICMA. Yes? Yes. And if we look at paragraph three, it sets out that the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister or the TEO may activate NICMA following a request to do so from the executive, correct? Yes. And I think if we look to the very last line of that paragraph, in the absence of any such requests, whenever TEO judges it appropriate to do so. Yes. Yes, so in other words, there's no... We'll come to the lead department in a moment, but it doesn't require the lead department, so to speak, to ask the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister to activate these arrangements. They have the power to do that. That's correct. And if we just go over the page, please, and if we look at paragraph nine, 
we see that this applies to two types of emergencies, the local one, and then over the page, the strategic one. And again, I think that's put in very broad terms, Sir David, at the top, that the government role in this kicks in whenever strategic level intervention is required. Is that right? Yes. And then if we go over the page, please, to paragraph 12. Again, it's set out there, the sorts of things that might require a strategic level approach. And as you might expect, things like very large numbers of people affected, yes. I think if we see, as we work through this, a high degree of public anxiety or implications beyond Northern Ireland, yes? Yes. And then if we look at paragraph 13, it sets out the different levels of strategic emergency. <coughs> And maybe if we just look at serious, and that's defined whenever a number of sectors might be affected or impacted. Yes? Yes. Or a number of organisations might be involved in responding. And then level three, catastrophic. So that applies to an emergency which has or which threatens catastrophic impact, correct? Yes. <clears throat> And it sets out there, TEO will facilitate the strategic multi-agency coordination through the activation of NICMA. UK-wide coordination will be delivered through activation of the Cabinet Office briefing room arrangements. Now, we know, obviously, that those COBRA arrangements began in January 2020. Yes. Level three suggests that there's some parity of arrangement or that, that this will kick in at the same time that COBRA kicks in? Is that your understanding as well? Um, uh, yes. Um, it depends what you mean by kicking in. All right. Um, what this tends to suggest is when an emergency reaches this stage, yes. that mm -hmm. COBRA will be operating in the United Kingdom and that these arrangements will be expected to be in place, again, as a sort of, a, I'm sorry to keep using this word, but as an analogue to the COBRA arrangements. Is that also your understanding? Yes, we will be in this process, um, but I think what, um, when people talk about activating NICMA, I think what they quite often mean is the setting up, sorry, the establishment of the civil contingencies group yes uh, and also the uh, establishment of the Northern Ireland hub yes and my view would be that you don't need to do either of those two things which are response functions until you've moved out of the prepare phase so you know my view would be that yes we were clearly um, being invited to uh, attend COBRAs. We were getting the briefings that were coming from them, but um, we had not reached the stage in sort of January, February, where, uh, my, in my view, it was appropriate to activate NICMA in the sense of establishing the Civil Contingencies Group and the uh, setting up the Northern Ireland Hub. Um, and certainly, I think it's also mentioned earlier in the document here, the role of the lead government department. Yes. Um, and for a health pandemic, it was well established that the Department of Health would lead on health pandemics of that nature. So in a, in a sense, <coughs> Department of Health was taking the lead in responding and preparing for and responding to the pandemic. Um, and we were in... Um, you know, regular contact with the Department of Health, like daily contact. So we would have been, you know, liaising very closely with them. And I was always very clear that at any point in time when they asked us to activate NICPA, and by that I mean uh, establish the Civil Contingencies Group and set up the Northern Ireland Hub, we would have done so. Um, now, it's now a matter of record that we didn't do that until, you know, the, the third week in March. Um, uh, and 
yeah, I think that was felt to be appropriate at the time, but I'm, I'm sure you want to push me on that. No, I'm, I'm, you've covered quite a lot of ground, and I've got quite a lot that I want to ask you about almost everything that you have said. I'm just focusing on at the minute on this document, Sir David, but I don't think it's, I mean, there's no question, there wasn't an analogue, so to speak, to COBRA operating in Northern Ireland from January. And That's I correct. think the first CCG meeting took place on the 20th of February. That's correct, yes. And then I think there was another one on the 12th of March. That was a ministerial one. That's correct. All right, well, we'll, we'll cover the ground um, probably in a bit more detail after lunch. Um, but I, I'm just, I don't know if I've got time you to know, just finish this yeah. document and then we can come back um, having done it. But if we look at paragraph 16, um, we can see that in terms of the the Northern Ireland executive role as foreseen in this protocol, um, a paragraph 16, it refers to them possibly or may wish to meet to consider the impacts of the emergency and to offer support to the members of the public affected. I'll come back in a second to that, if I may. Um, and then just if we continue over the page, please, to page eight. And we look at paragraph 19. Again, that sets out that level two and level three emergencies require direction, coordination and effective decision making at government level. Yes? Yes. And again, presumably that applies as much to the preparedness phase as it does to the responsive yes. phase. And then at paragraph 21, it sets out the structures for responding. <coughs> and we can just see if we follow that down to paragraph 2022, <coughs> certainly I think this protocol suggested that the civil contingencies group was the strategic coordination group. Yes? Yes. That it would be responsible for the overarching strategy. Yes? And uh, that's correct. And also that it would direct. When we've moved into the response phase, yeah. And that it would direct, it says there, it would direct the response and commit resources across Northern Ireland. Yes? Yes. And then it sets out the various roles that it might have. So, for example, directing and coordinating the efforts of government, sorry, of departments. And then second, assessing the wider impact of events as well. In terms of your delineation between preparedness and responding, obviously this protocol doesn't set out any such delineation. It, it, the premise of it is that it will apply when an emergency is anticipated. Why, why do you say that paragraph 22 is, is whenever the government is in response mode? Um, in a health... Um so in, in, in the circumstances we were facing where there was a, an emerging uh, pandemic, um, the role of CCG, um, you know, led by the executive office, would have been to coordinate the work of the departments other than the health department. You know, the health department would still have been in the lead when it came to or when uh, when it came to the actual health response to the pandemic. Um, so, you know, the view I would have had at the time and with my colleagues uh, in that area was that you don't want to establish CCG until that point in time where there is a need for departmental coordination in terms of response. Now, um, uh, we didn't actually establish CCG until I think it was the 18th of March. Yes. Um, I will concede now that it would probably have been prudent to have established it a few days earlier, perhaps at the end of the previous week. Um, and, and, and I say that for two reasons. Firstly, um, and again, this is uh, knowing what we know now, um, we didn't get the number of volunteers coming forward to staff up the hub, which provides support to CCG that we had anticipated. And for that reason, it would have been 
sensible, I think, to have established it a little earlier so that we could have known this and mitigated it sooner than we did. Now, in my view, um, we did mitigate the immediate absence of volunteers, sorry, the immediate shortage of volunteers I'm just quickly. I'll stop because we will come back and deal yeah. with staffing in more detail. I think the, the point really, though, is that this foresees the setting of an overarching strategy. Why isn't that as much a part of preparedness as it is of responding? Well, the it's the preparedness phase where you will be, in, in a sense, developing your planned response. Um, and uh, I, again, we can talk about resources later, but the people who were doing the preparation work in uh, the executive office, but also in departments, would have been the same people that would have been staffing up the hub. So our reluctance to, not reluctance, but uh, the decision to establish CCG when we did was in part because we wanted to use the resources available to us to best effect. So for example, in uh, early March, we had commissioned um, impact assessments from all departments. Uh, there had been a workshop on the 6th of March uh, facilitated by Chris Stewart and the CCPB team, which was looking at how we actually um, coordinate that exercise across departments. So that work um, was part of the preparedness work. And had we established the hub and civil contingencies group earlier, it might have compromised that work. All right, I think it's, I think it's, it's too important a <laughs> subject to get you to try and squeeze it yes. in before lunch, uh, Mr. Dublin. Uh, I'm sorry, Sir David, as you know, we have to take regular breaks, so we'll break now for lunch, and I shall return at 10 to 2. <laughs> <laughs>